The Spin Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No, my hoki mai ki other fault. I mihi ne ko Duncan Grieg talking wa. My guest today uh, is Vincent Herringer, who is appearing as part of O Media's sustainability series. I uh, cannot stress enough how grateful I am to O Media for sponsoring the fold. Without them, we just would not be here, which is an extremely unsustainable outcome. Um, but Vince, I was really good to catch up with him because th- th- this man was my boss um, for a couple of years in like 15 years ago when I worked at Real Groove magazine and he was the publisher at Tangible Media where we we um, we were sold to and I didn't realize then what a sort of powerhouse and and really kind of genuinely entrepreneurial dynamo uh, Vince was he it's kind of hard to know where, where to start he's the founder of um, Unlimited magazine um, Idealog magazine Good magazine Stop Press um, the, these are all publications which. You know, most of them are still going, which is honestly like says something about the the you know you've got to marry editorial and commercial to make a, any kind of media proposition work. That's you know, or, or almost all of them, and the fact that they're still going says that he got that part right. But there is actually a thread that ties them together. It's something about about the new and about people working on hard problems. Uh, there's certainly a sustainability piece in there. And so we talk about that, about what, what drove the him to create those publications, what sort of happened to them, and, and ultimately his journey, as I describe, upstream into looking at the same issues from – within yeah you know, from a business's perspective or an organization's perspective and this is really like a life's work if you look back over his cv he's always been in the sustainability space and um yeah and so so we talk about that we also talk about the fact like he was also part of the the sort of the group that founded the the science media center which has had uh, i think quite a profound impact on the way that uh, science-based stories are covered uh, in our media, and from and through there to why it's so hard to cover climate change and to to kind of finance the coverage of climate change because it is for the biggest story in the world. It is, as he rightly points out, it's really under resourced in terms of actual just grunts on the ground. And paradoxically, just as as the the story just becomes more and more constant, the actual number of journalists devoted to it is is really shrinking at the moment and. That's just a really hard problem to solve, but there's a lot in it in terms of how that story is communicated more broadly. Uh, just a really passionate, clever, restless, progressive guy, uh, and um, someone I've I've got a huge amount of time for. So it was was really fun to talk with Vince Herring uh, on the fold. Then up way, Vince, and welcome to the fold. Well, kia ora, Duncan. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, thank you for uh, for having some washed up media guy on your show. Oh, please! It's, it's uh, honestly, it's beautiful to have you know my my old boss uh, and and someone who's really pivotal to me in my early career. To, no way! To I was your boss for about five minutes. I oh, think. please! Uh, anyway, well, let's let's talk about let's let's go back to to that era when we were both uh, younger and fresher faced. Uh, you know. Tell me how, because you you are you have started a number of publications, most of which continue in some uh, form, which is amazing given the the absolute uh, bloodletting there's been in, in in magazine media over the past few years. I mean, first let's start off by by just explaining wh- why magazines for you. I like the form of magazines. I discovered magazines quite young. Um, I, when we were kids, we used to get a magazine called Look and Learn, and it, it merged actually with World of Wonder. So they were two uh, fantastic magazines. I just loved the ability to access uh, 
media through multi, you could read it backwards, you could read it for, you could just dive in. You didn't, it wasn't a sequential kind of linear True. experience, which is suited, you know, someone as discursive and ill-disciplined as me. So I love that format. And then at university discovered Metro magazine for the first time. And I would, you know, sit at Victoria University Library devouring Stephen Stratford and Nicola Leggett and, um, you know, Warwick Roger and, and just think, well, how, how do I get into that world? And ended up, that was my first job actually at Metro Magazine. So, you know, totally have a love affair with magazines. And and you, I mean, a lot of people, that's true, mostly they read it. Sometimes they want to work in it. They Very seldom do they actually go on and find, found titles, in fact, multiple titles. One that's particularly relevant to this discussion is, is Good Magazine, which was very early in, into to a space which is now extremely developed. Do you want to just explain what good was, what good is? It's still it's still um, it's still publishing, and and why you sort of went into that area? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, the timing was terrible. We launched about six months before the GFC, so uh, we had three issues that were just stonking, and then. It was hard yakka after that. Um, but the timing was all to do with this growing sense of, I mean, sustainability had been already a movement for quite some time, but there was a real mainstreaming of sustainable practice and thinking, and there was a desire for um, household shoppers, which, you know, kind of stereotypically is is women. And so we, we created a, a women's magazine that was really aimed about equipping people to make smarter decisions as consumers. Because there was this thinking at the time, uh, I think still relevant, but not completely right. But this thinking was actually it's consumer pressure that will make will force companies to be more ethical, to be more uh, less polluting, to be more aware of their footprint. If we could create a consumer movement that demanded green products, so that's kind of what it was a guide for you know being a, a greener, better consumer. And how did you know? Obviously, like. Notwithstanding the the sort of the big external factor that washed away a huge chunk of the publishing company quickly or, or slowly, uh, uh, you know, how did did it work? You know, in terms of that that you know that original intent. Yeah, totally, it did. Um, man, we went. We as I say, we had three issues, and we 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 those first three issues were fat full of ads, we, you know, we were so confident we were turning away McDonald's who wanted to advertise and we were like... You're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. you're like, no, you know. Amazing. You, you guys work it out and come back when you're ready. Um, the GFC really hit us and there was, uh, I remember a moment when um, Bill English uh, told someone who we knew in the Coral Lounge, there were two words, this was 2008, two words I don't want to hear, innovation and sustainability. And and we owned Ideologue magazine and Good magazine, and I was like, "Oh, great!" You know, <laughs> we thought we were popular, um, and there was there was sort of like a backlash, I think, uh, about um, particularly from the corporate sector, who were, I think, reading the tea leaves, were greatly relieved that the GFC allowed them to turn off their and dial down their sustainability efforts. And, of course, that's come back now to bite us big time because the world has heated up so much more. Um, but, yes, it did work because there there is a constituency and there is a group of advertisers and companies that are determined to carve out a sustainable economy. And so there, we had that kind of – there was a ground roots, you know, kind of – uh, grassroots support from the fa a fan base that was big enough, and then there was a big enough commercial sector to say, actually, this is still important. And um, <clears throat> you know, there's always going to be in big companies a stream of green activity, whether it's hybrids or a, a, a low emissions, um, you know, low footprint detergent or whatever. So yeah, we tapped into some of that stuff. It's it's funny now because we're talking about events. 15 years or so ago, and yet the actual broader environment's not dissimilar in the sense that, you know, cost of living, replace GFC with cost of living crisis, yeah. and but the same fundamental, whether it's driven by a consumer or, or a corporation, like we've gotten distracted by this stuff. What really matters is, you know, is, is dollars and cents. Do you feel like, you know, is there a sense of deja vu or do you think that? 
the that sort of space has broadly moved on to the point where it doesn't feel like it's going to be swept aside and and reset the clock the way it was in 2008? I think it has changed in that uh, we're now starting to... I, th- I think climate, if we're talking about climate, climate denialism is over. You know, that is not that is now fringe to the point of flat earth madness, which is fantastic. Um, n- now the kind of denial you get is is the sort of foot dragging from, from the centre right, which is, um, you know, it's not that bad. Gosh, we can't ruin the economy doing this, could we? Um, so in that sense, it's changed. So I think think that there's much greater awareness having lived through these ongoing fires and storms and surges of kind of real evidence of the effect of climate change. Um, What hasn't changed, I think, Duncan, is the media environment is still as difficult as ever. And I'm really curious, you know, like for the spinoff, you've I'm, you know, I'm amazed. I got out of the media business because I was so tired and and worn out of struggling with this business model. But you know, you 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 kind of started taking off just as I was, you know, taking off the boots. And how do you think? You know, is, has has the media environment changed so that now it's easier to fund things and. You know, sixty percent of this is the amazing statistic that we've dealt with in our industry. Sixty percent of the revenue has gone to Facebook, Google, and and Trade Me. You know, these kind of mass um, click um, orientated media, leaving the rest of us to fight over the remaining forty percent. And I don't think the the overall volume is, of spend has increased to cope with that. No, I mean, look, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I think, and, and a relatively complex one, in the sense that I think, broadly speaking, there is a like journalists are super open to writing about it. Like, you've got a relatively, you know, part of the fact that the economics of the business got hard is meant you've got a younger workforce maybe than than you would have had. Uh, relatively speaking, yep. 20, twenty years ago, and younger people demographically are more likely to. Uh, pay attention to this. The distribution has changed so radically, not just going to digital, but also social platforms, particularly Facebook, in terms of their role in it. And um, there's also kind of consumer behavior. I think people, because the news or uh, that are around sustainability stuff can often be confronting or, or a bit um, off-putting, people just don't click it. They, they they say that they're concerned about it, but it's like people who say they want to watch documentaries on Netflix and then their their watch list is too hot to handle or something. That that that's the sort of dichotomy that we live with. But more broadly, I think there's been a mainstreaming of the kind of thing that where where good was on some level a, a niche publication. And that's what magazines often are. We you know, the spin offs are a relatively mainstream publication. I would say a decent chunk of our commercial revenue comes from people who are wanting to tell stories yeah. that um or about the world, about the the work they're doing, that it was is broadly analogous to what was happening in good. So that is probably the, the fundamental change. It's just reaching a mass audience with yes. it's probably as, as hard as it ever was. Yeah, that's right. And I think what's happening with green and sustainability is the um the proposition is less now about green or sustainability, which becomes a, a, a kind of, um, what do you call it, a hygiene factor, you know. And yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. They are a client, so, you know, disclaimer, but cleanery is a, they're a, a detergent maker, so they make household cleaning products and they make them in sachets rather than bottles and liquid and stuff. And their proposition is um, uh, super clean, super green. But actually what works is super clean. Right. That's what people want. They want a cleaner. Oh, so, so, and, and it's green. Yeah. But what they want is super clean. And I think that's probably, that's the mainstreaming effect of what you're talking about is like sustainability is now being built in as kind of like, that's just part of the story. You can't imagine really launching a new product now that didn't have an answer to that question because the question is a, is a default. It's, it's among the first three. Yes. And I think that's probably the biggest change that I see is that, at a at a board level, you know, within organisations, they're so aware of their climate liability. They're so conscious of their footprint, both an ethical footprint and a climate footprint. And now the, the next 
cab off the rank is around biodiversity. And there's a, a super interesting report come out by um, SBN, by the Sustainable Business Network, about this desire. 86% of companies saying, we want to know how to engage with the biodiversity thing, you know, whatever it is, but we don't know how and there's no mechanism to do that. And that's the big change, I think, is this mainstreaming at a really senior level. And governments sort of come and go, but but actually I think out in the corporate world and out in the business world, this is now, that's BAU. It's interesting, you you, you know, you talk about that because, you know, when, when I had Nikki Wright on, on the podcast, you know, she also mentioned the fact that for for businesses now, this is like a big longitudinal product project. They've very frequently at a corporate level, they've put out their a sort of scorecard on which they will be self marking, but it's at least someone's doing it. You know, like there, there's almost the the momentum feels more solid there in a way. Do, do you feel like that because there, there's a sort of a legislative way to do it and then there's a social pressure way to do it the legislative thing feels sort of half done if you're being generous but what you're describing as a as a corporate board kind of shareholder investor matrix that is yep. actually having a more profound effect is that fair yeah I think that's that's exactly right what businesses seem to be feeling as a real push-pull thing. So the, the one hand, they're, they're pushed by changes in law and uh, there's a thing called, you know, just, let's talk acronyms, TCFD, which is the Task Force on Climate Financial Disclosures. And what that requires of companies and our industries is, to, is actually to create scenarios and declare their climate risks. And so from board level, they're like, Crikey, this is new. You know, this is like well, especially when you're criminally liable as a director <laughs> of a business. You know, exactly. So you're getting all these sort of push factors from government and from institutions. It's great, but then there are pull factors, right? And um, you know, we used to read these reports about our oh, sustainability is attractive to to people. People are pay, prepared to pay a premium. Um, the evidence seems to be more and more and more that sustainability is now a requirement from consumers. And they don't, and they don't want to be involved in supporting child slavery in their t- textiles, and they don't want to be having their farmers, um, you know, have be crapping in their rivers. And I think the awareness from a consumer point of view is so much higher. So I think companies are feeling that push and pull pressure, and it's really slow, but it is happening. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O-Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has the lowdown on everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. Join some of the superstars of the investment and business world as they share advice from their time in the US so you can make your mahi count in this massive market. The Investment Fix Podcast, brought to you by Invest New Zealand. Tune in today. So, I mean, just flipping back to to your career, you know, you you talked about sort of leaving publishing about the same time the spinoff was kicking off. That's almost ten years ago now. You sort of swam upstream into working more closely with uh, businesses on these kind of issues. You know, what what did you find when you when you moved moved upstream in that respect? Uh, I had a moment that I really remember of working on an insurance client. Uh, so I was, I was working in a PR agency. It was a really big insurance client, and a, a, a report from WWF landed about the state of species loss in the world. And uh, in the last forty years, which is sort of more or less, you know, when I've been alive, seventy um, percent of species have continued to decline. So it's, that's you know, it's in my time since mm. the Lorax has been written, you know, things have got a whole lot worse, not better. And I just have this moment of remembering looking up around the room and saying, I, I don't want to be 
I don't want to be here helping an insurance company get richer. I mean, insurance is good and you need it. I'm not against insurance, but they'll be fine. You know, they, they don't need me. They'll be they'll be just fine without me. And I really wanted to devote myself to working on climate, sustainability, um, nature-based solutions. I didn't quite know how, uh, so I just I quit <laughs> and thought, oh, well, you know, that's a good way to start, isn't it? And so, you know, that, that's a quite a... It's like a scene, you know, and 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 what happened next, and and like, did did you find that from that sort of starting point that there that it was relatively easy to to move it move into that space, or yeah, I mean, it sounds more heroic than it needs to be, doesn't it? I mean, I had good networks, you know, we've been around for a while, you and me, so we know lots of people. Um, it really wasn't hard for me to ring up a few people. David Downs at um, Trade and Enterprise, Lance Wiggs at Puna Kaiki Fund, you know, a few mates to say, uh, suddenly I, I'm on my own, what, what shall I do? This is the territory I want to be in around climate, around sustainability, food and, and so on. And quickly the, the, the PR work and the consulting work built up. So, you know, I definitely have crossed the line out of journalism and into PR, I'm sorry to say, Duncan. But um, all right. <laughs> But what I did find was, oh, the other thing I did was started a podcast. I just thought, wouldn't it be good to force yourself to interview someone every week? Um, you know, I could do an MBA or something, but I'm I'm probably just a bit too lazy to do that. So I thought, let's just interview someone every week, and that'll be my MBA. You know, boning up on this stuff. So um, this climate business uh, has been going. I've done 111 interviews now. So one every week, pretty much. And it just forces you, I mean, you would know this, you, it just forces you to wrap your head around an issue, meet some interesting people. And when you throw yourself with a yes kind of attitude into the world, it's amazing what comes back. So I'm super busy, some of it paid, some of it not paid, um, working what I think is really values aligned. So they, those areas that I've described, you know, around sustainability, biodiversity, climate, um, that turns me on and I want to be working in that space for the next whatever it is, what I've got left. So thinking about this this climate business, that you know, that's you know, much much like the the fold, that's sort of narrowly uh, focused on a particular area. The, the, uh, are there particular guests or episodes or moments that stand out where you sort of started to really kind of feel like something had unlocked for you or you you could see where New Zealand was going in that yeah, respect. It's interesting. I hadn't. Uh, I think um, two things come to mind. Um, just recently, I interviewed a guy called um, Cornell uh, Tukuri, and he's with uh, Tataki Auckland Unlimited, which is sort of the promotions arm of, uh, and he's a senior Māori advisor. And he told a really interesting story that when the climate crisis was announced by the Mayor at the time, Goff, Phil Goff, and he invited the Iwi leaders to come and join him in the ceremony to talk about announcing the climate crisis. And this is a story secondhand that comes from Nati Teata, a tribe in South Auckland, Iwi in South Auckland. And they said, Well, not really. We've actually been in crisis for 150 years and you've just <laughs> discovered it. And it's such a good kind of like insight of like, you know, Māori have been watching the decline of their natural world, you know, the, the awa covered up in culverts, the, the seas polluted, uh, you know, forests chopped down. And, and they've been feeling this crisis for some time. And it, it does it does feel a bit sort of dumb and white to be... <laughs> You know, it's like just oh. so making a big show of announcing it, and then maybe doing not all that much. Yes, and then and then kind of on top of that is that sort of intergenerational responsibility of like, oh, it turns out you know there are going to people after us. Uh, we didn't really think about that, did we? So that that's been great, and and getting to know more of the uh, incredibly generous and lovely, intelligent, hardworking people in Iwi who are who are right at the cutting edge of these 
of kind of working with natural systems, uh, uh, that's been great. And I'm in a, r- r- right at the beginning of that journey, so I, you know, I feel very naive and but excited. Um, there's another moment where you, you're talking to um, quite senior business people, like CEO of Comvita or Silver Fern Farms, and you think, well, these are pretty mainstream corporate publicly listed businesses, and they are talking the language. And I don't think it's just talking, Duncan. I actually think they're really serious that, you know, we are nature-based businesses. If we shit in our own nest, actually we don't have a business. And it's, again, it's sort of blindingly obvious, but why has it not been built in properly into the way we count things, the way we measure things, the the way we... um, you know, account, our financial system just doesn't account for natural assets. And I think that's changing, and it's changing quite fast now, but it's taken a long time. And, and yeah, so those kind of two things have come out of the podcast for me is get, getting to know more Māori and this sort of awakening for me, I, I guess, about, geez, what is this whenua that we inhabit? I've never really thought about it. Yeah, how, how's it evolving? And, yeah. it, and it kind of, uh, you know, I'm embarrassed to sort of say it because, you know, it's kind of slightly dumb, but, oh, well. We're all on our own journeys, you know, at, <laughs> at our own pace. And, and I think that that's, you know, like inevitably society kind of needs to, to actually kind of uh, stare at this thing rather than stare past it. I want to switch tack a bit because, you know, like, You've, you've had this quite amazing career in terms of starting things, and one of the things you started that is also still still uh, going is something that within our sort of sector of the media, and you know, really felt this during the pandemic is the um, is the science media centre, uh-huh. yep. and you know, I, like it's 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 probably doesn't have a huge public profile uh, by design in some respects, but for to to you know to help journalists kind of navigate a, a, a kind of complex world to tell more sort of well well sort of founded uh, science based stories it's it's incredibly useful. Do you want to just tell me about where that came from and how you went about sort of building? You know, these are three constituencies in terms of um, you know. Scientists and the ac- and uh, academics, government and, and media, which are often in, if not in conflict, they they, they can feel misaligned. And yeah. You figured out a ma- way to make it work. Well, they should exist in tension. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's a healthy ecosystem to be holding each other to account. Um, well, the motivation for that came from uh, very much from a guy called Peter Griffin, who was a, still an active journalist, a terrific guy who had noticed. Um, has he been on the He has show? been on the fold. He's, he's a fantastic journalist. Yeah. yeah. Really, really good. So a really guy. serious guy and a filmmaker as well. Um, had seen overseas that the Science Media Centre, particularly in London, was quite successful. And the, the problem that they were addressing was this uh, lack of knowledge on journalist side of basic science and suspicion from scientists of, uh, you know, journalists being sort of oversimplifying and, um, you know, sensationalising, um, both of which are caricatures of each other, right? Um, and... Um, so Peter had seen this. He he assembled a really good case with uh, what was then the Ministry of Science, who stumped up some funding, and we worked. I got invited in as the founding chair, and we set up an establishment board, and we worked really closely with the Royal Society to, to set this. Up. Royal Society is the kind of like the industry body for for scientists. So with funding from the Ministry, uh, governance from the Royal Society, and then Peter's just phenomenal commitment to it. Uh, it. It became a real success. And uh, so the proposition was, c- could we educate um, journalists about science and create a kind of a reliable list of peer-reviewed scientists that you could go to for comment and at the same time equip the scientists to, to be prepared to, to talk in plain language at the drop of a hat to meet media deadlines about their subject area, knowing that they would be in a kind of safe environment. So that was the proposition. And the mechanism for doing that was uh, they did 
media, media training for scientists. So they worked with the CRIs, the universities, the private institutes to do media training for journalists, uh, for, for scientists, just to, to sort of help them overcome the sort of prejudice about media. Then, as I say, produce this kind of re- list of reliable go-to people for journalists to say, man, if, you, if there's an earthquake, don't talk to Ken Ring, the moon man. <laughs> Which, we, honestly, we did as a community for a long time. We used Ken Ring, the moon man, as a measure of success because, you know, he got a huge amount of coverage, particularly in the Herald. Yeah. And the measure of success is could we get Ken Ring, the moon man, out of the Herald? And we did. That's, that's just such a good single data point that really <laughs> is, is, is proof. Uh, the, the thing that's interesting... To, to me and and kind of troubling in some respects is that you know I think in general like you know you can really feel the impact of the science media center I think we do in general there's a much greater degree of responsibility in, in journalism around uh, sort of science-based stories but there is also a lot you know the the number of journalists who are operating in you know realms that that are sort of directly applicable to science has gone down as, as, as shrunk, as, yeah. As, as journalism has more broadly. Now, you you've done some or been part of some research that kind of tried to figure out what a solve for that was, yeah. uh, which was both successful research and not necessarily a successful outcome. Do you want to just tell that yeah, story? Yeah, sure. So um, I got briefed by a really wonderful outfit called Fokutupu Aotearoa, which is a private group of funders who are. Uh, their mission is to fund ecological restoration projects, and they, what they do is they're not sort of ongoing funders. They really like to start things and, and get things going. So, for instance, they've funded the Auckland Climate Festival is what they've kick-started, and they, they fund um, some oceans research and so on. Um, so awesome group, and they, they were curious about why is it that there's so little public discourse serious public discourse about climate change and it's so ex- a lot of it's so extreme a lot of it's so frankly stupid um particularly in the media right and and why do the good voices really struggle to be heard so i commissioned uh me and a guy called ben fahey who uh is, was former publisher of ideologue and listener and north and south and so on metro um, we did a whole bunch of interviews and some desk research to just kind of unpack why is climate change so badly reported in the media, so underreported. So this is the story of the century. You know, this is this is the meteorite that's rushing towards the earth, and um, and it's really hard to get coverage. There's still, by my count, only seven journalists who are dedicated to this beat, and. Um, and now there's less because uh, you know stuff had invested quite a lot into that, but but with this latest round of um, changes, you know they're actually withdrawing their investment in this space, which I think is a real shame. But I mean, there's probably good reasons for it. Um, and even those seven or eight journalists, they're not. This is not their only thing. So someone like um, Jamie Morton from the Herald, here's the, and that whole NZ Me enterprise. How many journalists would they have? Three hundred. He's, he is the only science reporter, but then his science is only a third of his beat. He's also health and climate change. I, mean, I don't know what to say. You know, it's just, it's it's ridiculous. It's offensive. It's, it's stupid. Um, and, you know, why is it that that, that burden of, not the burden, but you know, it's such an exciting beat. It's full of drama, politics, economics, humanity, science, um, indigenous stories. It, it's it's a it's a beat that's rich with potential for storytelling. And I think probably the spin-off in Radio New Zealand and Newsroom are the only ones that are actually devoting resources to it. Anyway, so that was the. <laughs> that was kind of like the the proposition is what what's going on? Why is it so hard in media in particular, but also outside of media to talk about climate change in an informed and an intelligent way? 
And I mean, yeah, you know, and I think it is that is a sort of it's sort of a tragedy of the commons kind kind of thing where, or, or I don't know, there's there's, there's a bunch of different economics um, terms that that sort of fit here. Uh, it's sort of everybody and nobody. Yeah, I mean, like, like it's a, so it sort of benefits everyone. It's not it's not a kind of a it's a weird area climate ch- climate change journalism in that. Uh, it is it is consuming for people, but while you're right to identify, it is a fantastic beat. It is a beat where to to responsibly tell tell the story, especially a sort of a modulated element of it. You know, you're not necessarily going to have an alarmist headline on it. If you put that on it, you make people angry, but you get the clicks. If you try and kind of, but you don't want to make people despair. You want to kind of give people hope, but you don't want to give people too much hope so that they don't yeah. believe in the scale of story. It's, 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 it is the biggest story of the century. It's also an incredibly complex one. And I think it's one that a, you know, to, a sustainable journalism would be very well equipped to tell um, that was adequately resourced. And unfortunately, we just don't live in an era where there um, there is a, a sort of a social political will to to kind of create an environment where where yeah. you can have the sort of bench of science and climate science reporters yeah. that you would hope would would exist in most um, scale news organisations. Well, I, I think if you make an analogy with something like the health beat, um, you know, health is it's ever present, it's always with us, it's rich with from a journalistic point of view, it's rich with potential of. It's got funding dramas. It's got life and death. It's got heroes. It's got villains. You know, as a beat, and it's, it's, got, and it's got people, and 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 that's you know always yeah uh, the easiest way into a story that's going to affect a kind of a mass of people, right? And, and that possibly is what's missing out of the climate story. It's arisen out of science, and science, as much as I love science, you know, my degrees in biochemistry, so I just you know I die. You know, on all the science media centre stuff, and uh, but I'm in the minority. I get that, you know that, and and so maybe because it's arisen out of a, it's a question of physics, you know, it's a question of how how much carbon dioxide can the atmosphere tolerate before it acidifies the ocean. You know, so it's actually a question of physics, isn't it? So maybe part of the solution, and we'll get to a bigger part of the solution, but a small part of the solution is humanising it and and telling the human story. And we see that in catastrophes, in fires, in floods, in, in banks falling down on houses and people dashing out the door with seconds to spare. So that's kind of, I think, a one way into it. Uh, and it's legit. Um, but I think what you have touched on earlier is that it's a, what you, economists would call a market failure. Precisely. A, a complete catastrophe of um, two lines kind of missing each other. One is importance, and one is um, is is kind of commercial returns or something, and they just zoom past each other without touching. And so there needs to be, if you if you want to solve this problem, if you want climate change addressed, both increase the volume but also the quality, someone has to invest. You're doing it with your own efforts with the spin-off. Um, I'm doing it in my own little small way, you know, so each in our corner. Um, there's There are some transformational opportunities here for private investors. Uh, where's Jeff Bezos when we need him? Um, for governments, for corporations to say, actually, if this, if this thing is really important and... Only seven people in New Zealand are covering it kind of from an independent, it needs a solution. I've written the report. You're welcome to read it. <laughs> <laughs> no, to- totally, uh, obviously, incredibly, uh, <laughs> like that, that, that is um, where I live and and uh, I, I can't pretend to be disinterested in it. But, um, but yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. To, to sort of finish up, I mean, like, the, the yeah you know, you've devoted the largest part of your career to um you know s- s- different things that operate uh, under that sort of sustainability particularly kind of climate um uh science you know and 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 have been at it from kind of 
every angle in, in some respects. Do you do you feel like you know the the general health, like what the 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 so societal and business kind of uh, you know fundamentals of of that are, are tracking the right way, setting aside the kind of the you know whatever kind of polarized moment and kind of weird negative incentives of social media might be to kind of yeah. surface particular comments. Like how how are we going? Um, it was really hard to. Uh, Mike Cutchison, our you know our friend and. Uh, mentor, he used to say, it's really hard to read the label when you're inside the jar. And so I really feel like I'm in the system, so it's very hard to be independent. But a couple of observations um, from being in it. Um, just a little sort of signpost. You see, a couple of days ago, Takahe was released into the wild in the South Island. Amazing. Um, our producer even it knows that story. Awesome. <laughs> um, that's Those are little signposts, right? And, and Kiwi now... Getting and Kaka getting out of Zealandia and starting to kind of migrate into the bush and in neighbourhoods and around Kelvin and Wellington. Um, those are little signposts that you can feel like we're at a certain point on a bell curve. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah, that's right. Um, I think from a systems and kind of governance point of view, the massive changes in the last five years is that acronym I just mentioned, TCFD. There's the Zero Carbon Act. There's the Ad- Climate Adaption Plan and Climate. Um, adaptation plan and the other one, just a mitigation plan. They're, and these are, they're not going to be undone. E- even with a national act government, they'll be tweaked. They'll not be undone. And so f- some really amazing building blocks put in there at an institutional level. And, and same, you, you know, in the accounting world, they, they have these sort of international standards. And those things are now being built in impact reporting and climate reporting and stuff. It's pretty fundamental. Another little sort of, I suppose, a sort of personal anecdote is wherever I go, I see uh, farmers, companies, communities engaging with Māori in a way that didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, In an an upper hut, uh, it was quite segregated communities, um, a lot of antipathy, I thought, growing up between Māori and Pākehā at that is changing, and I think it's changing really fast, and in, in such a positive way that the rhetoric that gets used at a kind of government, a, a sort of political level, out on the hustings, I don't think that actually, I don't think that's happening at, at a community level. I think this, the co-governance thing, is not landed as a political device to whack people with because actually it's working quite well at a local level. So uh, little signposts, I reckon, Duncan, of incredible health. And then you go, um, my family, hopefully not listening to this, but you go for a weekend, you know, for the family reunion. And it's like the climate, biodiversity, species, these things don't exist. You know, what what, what matters to them is the, you know, they can't drive to the wire wrapper anymore because there's a slip on the Rima Tuckers and someone should fix it. And um, so, you know, kind of little moments of despair of like, really? But in some ways, it, you know, it, it doesn't have to engage everyone so long as uh, parts of government and business that people interact with are ultimately they have pieces in there that are properly embedded in their organizations that yeah, are yeah. working, you know, like that, that's that sometimes kind of, I think, Gets lost, and it, and certainly my my sense is that that these these aren't sort of coming and going within organisations now. They're in there. Yeah, and I think actually just one other thought onto this is that um, you know humans will do their bit, but actually to Tayo, I think the natural world is going to have its say, and it is having its say. And uh, well, that's quite a powerful communication channel it's got. <laughs> Yeah, we're just going to wipe out your entire horticultural base over one weekend. Uh, and, you know, so, so those biological indicators are completely terrifying about this, the, um, you know, the warming of the oceans, the shrinking of the glaciers. Those things, they freak me out. And, you know, we should have been doing this human stuff 20, 40, 50 years ago. It's happening now. And 
but you know the natural world is working to its own pace very true hey thank you so much for coming on the fold today Vince really really enjoyed catching up and just hearing the all of the different pieces of, of the story of how you got here thanks Duncan I really admire what you're doing big big fan thank you for so much it's very kind That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.